Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support, subscribe. The Unforgivable Afterlife of Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr is mostly known for her marriage to King Henry VIII and being the last of six wives. But her story starts before and continues long after him. Catherine was born sometime in 1512 and was the daughter to Sir Thomas Parr of Kendal, an official of the royal household. Catherine was married twice before Henry, first as a teenager to Sir Edward Burrow of Gainsborough Hall, and then a year after the young sir's death in 1533, Catherine married a middle-aged John Neville, third Baron Latimer of Snape Castle in North Yorkshire. In 1536, during the Pilgrimage of Grace, Snape Castle was captured by rebels and Catherine and her Neville stepchildren were held hostage and threatened with death if Baron Latimer did not give in to their demands. The begilded Latimer saved his family but died in 1543, leaving Catherine as a 30-year-old widow. Slender, vital and attractive, Catherine wanted to marry for love before her youth was lost. The man she wanted was Thomas Seymour, brother of Henry's third queen, Jane, who died in 1537 after the birth of Prince Edward. But instead, the widowed Lady Latimer's hand was solicited by King Henry. Catherine and Henry were then married at Hampton Court in July of 1543. Catherine had known Henry long before this, as she and her mother had been ladies-in-waiting to his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, and then Catherine served in the household of Princess Mary. Queen Catherine Parr was described as loving colour and finery, and that she was of a lively and pleasing appearance, and was praised as a virtuous woman. In 1544, she was noted for being dressed in a robe of cloth of gold and a petticoat of brocade with sleeves limed with crimson satin and trimmed with three piled crimson velvet. Her train was more than two yards long. Suspended from her neck were two crosses and a jewel of very rich diamonds, and in her headdress were many and beautiful ones. Her griddle was of gold with large pendants. Catherine had tact, and this enabled her to exert a beneficial influence on the king during the last years of his reign. Close friendships were born between Catherine and her stepchildren, and Catherine devoted herself to their education. Although Henry and Catherine were not a match made from love, there is every indication that their marriage became one of a genuinely loving nature. Towards the end of the king's life, and with his health deteriorating, the daily discomfort he felt ratcheted towards agony, leading him to being convinced by the pro-Catholic faction of the court that his queen was a dangerous heretic who plotted against him. Luckily for Catherine, a well-wisher leaked the arrest warrant to her, and she was able to use her wits and quick thinking to convince the king that in matters of faith she looked only to him, for all answers and direction. Henry was mollified, and when officials came to arrest the Queen, he berated them as knaves and fools. Catherine and Henry were then perfect friends again, and would remain so until he died on January the 28th, 1547. Not wanting to waste time and be with the man she loved, after a six-month period of mourning, Catherine married Thomas Seymour. But what began in joy ended in a slow and painful death for Catherine. Catherine had given birth to a daughter, Mary Seymour. And when she was just one week old, Catherine died of perparal sepsis. It is thought that Mary went to live with Catherine's closest friend, Catherine Willoughby, the Dowager Duchess of Suffolk, but that Mary unfortunately died in early childhood. After her death, Catherine lay in repose at Sudley, for a short time. Then her body was wrapped in Cree, a cloth treated with wax, and placed in a form-fitting lead coffin. Into the soft lead was impressed K.P. Here lieth Queen Catherine, wife to King Henry VIII, and the wife of Thomas, Lord of Sudley High Admi. 
of England and Yankel to King Edward. Miles Coverdale preached a sermon and Lady Jane Grey was the chief mourner at the funeral, which is believed to be the first Protestant service of its kind in England. Afterwards, the Queen was buried within the chapel. Catherine laid at peace beneath Sudley Chapel for well over 200 years, but as the estate and church went into ruin above her, she remained largely unchanged. In the summer of 1782, Mr John Lucas, who occupied the land of Lord Rivers, whereon the ruins of the chapel stand, had the courtesy to rip the top of the coffin off, expecting to discover within it only the bones of the Queen, but to his great surprise found her whole body wrapped in six or seven sheer cloths of linen, entire and uncorrupted, although it had lain there upwards of two hundred and thirty years. His unwarranted curiosity led him to make an incision through the sheer cloth that covered Catherine's arms and found her to still be white and moist. Mr Brooks, who wrote an account of this in the book The Opening of the Queen's Grave, shared his displeasure of Mr Lucas's actions and forwardness, saying that it would have been quite sufficient to have just found the Queen's resting place and then report it to the appropriate person. It is thought that it was around this time that hair clippings and a swatch of fabric from Catherine's burial dress were taken. The account continued. In the summer of the year following 1783, his lordship's business made it necessary for me and my son to be at Sudley Castle, and on being told what had been done the year before by Lucas, I directed the earth to be once more removed to satisfy my own curiosity and I found Lucas's account of the coffin and corpse to be just as he had represented them, with this difference, that her body was then grown quite fetrid, and the flesh where the incision had been made was brown, and in a state of putrefaction, in consequence of the air having been let in upon it. The stench of the corpse made my son quite sick, whilst he copied the inscription which had on the lead of the coffin, I afterwards decided that a stone slab should be placed over the grave to prevent any further and improper inspection. Unfortunately, this was not the last time that poor Catherine's body was disturbed. In 1792, her coffin was dug up by drunken revellers and reburied upside down. Twenty-five years later, Lord Chandos wanted to move Catherine to a safer tomb. The excavation was done by Reverend John Lates, who had undertaken the repairs of the chapel, and Edmund T. Brown, a Wincombe antiquary, whom Transaction Notes wrote of this discovery on the 18th of July, 1817. Brown reported that after considerable search, the coffin was found bottom upwards in a walled grave, where it had been deposited. It was then removed to the Chandos vault, and we proceeded to examine the body. But the coffin having been so frequently opened, we found nothing but the bare skeleton, except a few pieces of sear cloth, which was still under the skull, and a dark coloured mass, which proved to contain, when washed, a small quantity of hair, which exactly corresponded with some I already had. The roots of ivy, which you may remember grew in such profusion on the walls of the chapel, had penetrated into the coffin, and completely filled the greater part of it. We then had the different pieces of lead, which from time to time had been cut from the coffin, firmly nailed together, so as to present the original form of the coffin, and it was placed onto two large flat stones by the side of the former Lord Chandos. Dr Nash said, the Queen must have been low of stature, as the lead which enclosed her corpse was but five foot four inches in length. Actually, a height of about five foot four inches was considered middling for a woman of the late 1500s, and accords well within a woman who, when live, was neither described as tall or small. Brown concluded that the ancient chapel which had been desecrated by the Puritans was thoroughly renovated under the direction of Sir John Gilbert Scott and a handsome decorated altar tomb surmounted by the Gothic canopy was erected on the north side of the Saccharum to the memory of Queen 
Catherine Parr, whose effigy was rendered as correctly as it could be from the portraits which are extant. Safe under the Alberster image that returned stone flesh to her bared bones, Queen Catherine Parr's restful eternity had at last begun. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.